Welcome to today's Energy Justice Seminar. We are really excited today to have Denise Abdul Rahman from the NAACP. She's a widely recognized thought leader on energy democracy. She's made significant contributions on advancing community organizing for energy justice. She's currently the Energy Democracy Policy Fellow for the National NAACP Environmental Climate Justice Program, ECJP. Uh, she's additionally acted as the regional field organizer for the Midwest and Plain States and served as the Environmental Climate Justice Chair of the Indiana State Conference of the NAACP. Denise holds a management degree and an MBA in healthcare management and health information uh, from Indiana University School of Informatics. <clears throat> In recognition for her tireless work and leadership on pursuing energy justice, she received the Faith Base Reverend Mosul Sanders Drum Major for Humanities Award 2020, the Indiana University Robert McKinney School of Law Environmental Protector War Award in 2019, and NAACP Indiana Hazel B. Hunter Award 2019. We are very delighted to have her here to share her experience with us today. Uh, and please join me in an initial round of applause for Denise Abdul Rahman. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor and a uh, privilege to be here virtually with you at uh, Yale University. Um, the state uh, which our very own president, uh, Scott Easdale, of the Connecticut uh, State Conference uh, serves. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sophie Genoway and Professor Gilliam and uh, Professor Torres. And I was asked to share about uh, community advocacy and organizing. Uh, and within the energy justice frame and much of my talk will be um, through the lens of the NAACP and the energy justice movement more broadly uh, focused on uh, just transition of communities. So let's talk about imagining an equitable clean energy future. The uh, NAACP works every day uh, to stop environmental injustices, uh, which includes climate change uh, that have disproportionate impacts on communities of color and uh, low income communities in the United States and around the world. Uh, the program was created to provide resources and support uh, community leadership in addressing this human and civil rights issue by advocating for uh, three various objectives. Uh, the first objective is to reduce uh, harmful emissions, particularly greenhouse gas emissions. Our members uh, fight every day to shut down coal fire power plants and other fossil fuel plants. Um, and uh, they work at the local level um, and they try to build, stop the building of uh, new facilities. Uh, they fight for the monitoring uh, of the pollutants and things of that nature and the enforcement of regulations at the federal and state level, including ensuring corporate uh, responsibility. And uh, they work to advance clean energy and energy efficiency. Again, working at the state level, uh, working with uh, small businesses and unions on developing demonstration projects to ensure that communities of color are accessing the revenue generation and opportunities in the new energy economy while providing safer, more sustainable mechanisms for managing their energy needs for the communities and beyond. And next, uh, strengthening the community's re resilience and livability. Uh, pictured here is uh, my brother, an adamant fisherman out of the Wabash River. And I'm always concerned as to whether or not there's coal ash uh, and mercury that's emitted uh, 
that these uh, fish are consuming uh, and, uh, and the impacts um, that it has on the wildlife and their uh, longevity. So we work with uh, communities to work on climate action plans uh, to integrate uh, policies and practices such as food justice, uh, transportation equity, and up upholding civil and human rights uh, in emergency management and uh, facilitating uh, participatory democracy. Next, I'd like to uh, tee up uh, this video by John Fiji, um, and it really is going to epitomize um, environmental injustice. This was before the pandemic. Hashtag, we can't breathe. The city of Baytown is made of old money, lower to middle class families and pollution. But if you get a job at a chemical plant, you don't have time to think of a solution. I guess my brother, my uncle, and my cousins are sellouts because they went industrial instead of the drug route. Refinery city lights and pipes run along the Gulf Coast. The smoke boasts with sofa air. It's a wonder. Anyone's able to take a breath. We're so used to it, we forget. Soon, the sons and daughters won't be able to drink the water. They say the first priority is the people, but the people are the ones being excluded and uprooted. Just ask Archer Courts, ask George Washington Carver Elementary, or ask the Suburbanites. Exxon Sacrifice, AKA Brownwood Neighborhood. God bless social media, but Flint ain't the only case of complexion without protection. Baytown, AKA the Dirty Bay, is surrounded by giant toxins threatening the city in every way. We see the huge steel from our window sills make jokes as we choke. We've been possibly dying from this kind of poison oak. It's no mystery that the black and brown communities are being targeted. Black lives matter, but not when they're expendable and making money is good for the market. Give them a fine, it's fine. They can afford it. We live with the headaches, the shortness of breath, and watery eyes. They keep building and we pay for it. Constantly trying to heal ourselves and repel the environmental destruction. Breathe it in. Then breathe out. So again, that one really uh, exemplifies uh, the environmental injustice and uh, teeing up one more video back to back. Uh, this one displays the possibilities and the injustice at the same time. The thing about hip hop, about hip hop, hip hop, and today it's, is, it's smart, it's insightful. Let hip hop lead the way to a great future. We can see a much deeper economic downturn. Global warming Last is month, real. The fires have been fueled by a high rate of asthma. The state is by Katrina. We're sure to follow, and now they are. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. Yeah, I make the track sound good. 
and do that. Got a message for the hood. It's time to go green. We gotta go green. The food ain't fresh and the air ain't clean. From the hood to the birds, everybody go scream. Dr. King, we live in your dream. My president is black, but it's going green. So my president is black, but it's going green. So my president is black, but it's going green. I got my president back. And I'm gonna do the same thing. Now why your little cousin got asthma? Auntie got cancer. I know you know the problem, but you never knew the answer. You want the answer? Listen to my stance. When it come to cold, they be stripping like a dancer. Who the company and who the boss like Tony Dancer? Maybe one day we probably get a chance to have a conversation about conservation. He rather kind of nation for compensation. Look, I'm from the hood. We need better food and better air. You probably wouldn't never care. You ain't never there. Rappers never rap about it. They rather act hard. Why these companies doing toxic in my backyard? I'm from the hood. The refinery ain't that far. Something like my neighbor ain't doing me no favors. We need more classes, not more sales. Man, we need green jobs. We don't need no jails. I said it's time to go green. We gotta go green. The food ain't fresh and the air ain't clean. From the hood to the birds, everybody go green. Dr. King, we live in your dream. My president is black, but it's going to green. So my president is black, but it's going to green. So my president is black, but it's going to green. I got my president back. I'll do the so same thing. That most need work with the work that most need done. We need funds, we can harness the sun, we can harness the wind, we can create jobs for my family and friends. Now, when I say I'm going green to the hood, it sounds funny, but I'm talking about saving the earth and getting money. I'm talking about hundreds, thousands of M's. Do that, go pull up in a hybrid on rims. So when I hit the block, y'all, the song go knock y'all. Car on E, but the car won't stop y'all. It's electric, so it's guaranteed to shock y'all. Yeah, I'm going green, and I'm straight from the block, y'all. Want the green Bentley? I ain't talking about the paint. I'm talking about the one with biofuel in the tank. So many leaders paved the way for the leaders of today. These are shoulders that we stand on. Now we all hands on. America can create millions of well-paid green collar jobs. We can make our streets safer and our communities healthier. We can save the planet for our children and our children's children. That is the promise of a green economy. It's time to go green. We gotta go green. The food ain't fresh and the air ain't clean. From the hood to the birds, everybody go green. Dr. King, we live in your dream. My president is black, but it's going green. So my president is black, but it's going green. So my president is black, but it's going green. We will put Americans to work making our homes and buildings more efficient so that we can save billions of dollars on our energy bills. We need to ultimately make clean, renewable energy the profitable kind of energy. Develop technologies like wind power and solar power, advanced biofuel, and more efficient cars and trucks built right here in America. Uh, so I really uh, like to use both of those videos. I feel like it gives a great cultural grounding and it is considered when one goes into communities and works with communities using culturally competent, relatable information. And also for those that may not necessarily be connected to the community, in, in my perspective, it's to show uh, why uh, people are working and so adamant uh, in this, uh, this work. Uh, and so uh, the NAACP with the Our Power uh, Communities uh, helped to create a framework called the Just Transition Framework. And the Just Transition is all about um, resisting, rethinking, and restructuring, um, stopping all that extracts from our economy, from, from our communities, and building the new and creating a thriving, caring, um, living community. It's about shifting the economic control to communities, democratizing the wealth and the workplace, advancing ecological restoration, 
driving racial justice and social equity and relocalizing most production and consumption and retaining and restoring cultures and traditions. And with that, I often tell my own like personal uh, story that one I identify as a person of African descent and that as a person of African descent, we've been seeking a just transition for over 401 years. Um, we've endured the transatlantic slave trade and the Middle Passage. Over 12 million uh, people of African descent were transported here to America. Over 60 million uh, died uh, during what uh, is called the African Holocaust. Uh, in the words of Billie Holiday, we've been the strange fruit. We've endured Jim Crow, redlining. In the words of Michelle Alexander, we've been fighting the war on drugs, the mass incarceration system, or Jim Crow's brother, James Crow, who systematically calculates the number of our Black lives, our Black children, from the moment they're in the third grade to be infused into the prison uh, to school pipeline. Many of our communities are over-policed, our educational systems are under-resourced, uh, blighted and dilapidated housing and old housing stock, outdated combined sewage overflows, food apartheid conditions, unequitable greenery and aesthetics. We are the under, underemployed and the unemployed. We've been the essential workers most disproportionately impacted by this pandemic and the hosters of these polluting systems such as fossil fuel, vehicle emissions, and most disproportionately impacted by the impacts of climate change. Um, and that is not to say that this group of vulnerable uh, population in these conditions doesn't have great historical legacy, uh, has great resilience, and brings uh, many gifts and genius uh, to the world and, and, and to this space. And again, uh, our journey has been over 401 years. So when working uh, in uh, the environmental and climate justice space or energy justice space, uh, many uh, came together uh, on the Jemez, uh, New Mexico in 1996 to create these uh, Jemez principles for uh, democratic organizing. And uh, the purpose, uh, there were um, several people of color and European American representatives, and they got together and they hammered out these economic justice uh, and environmental principles with the intent of creating a common understanding between the different cultures, politics, and uh, organizations. So uh, there's six of them uh, being inclusive uh, and making sure uh, that you do bottom up uh, organizing. There are groups, uh, even the NAACP, if we're not applying these principles that helicopter into communities, um, thinking that you're saving a community as opposed to appreciating the intelligence, the historical legacy, and the knowledge that they have living in the conditions that they're uh, living in. Um, also, I have an example of um, someone told me that uh, someone built a greenhouse in like uh, Sudan or somewhere, uh, and they they thought they were doing really good by building this greenhouse, but this greenhouse just sat there. And it sat there because uh, the, the community that lived there had no knowledge about the greenhouse, no one socialized the greenhouse with them. And so therefore it served uh, no purpose. So thus you, you must uh, do the bottom up organizing, let people speak for themselves, work in solidarity and mutuality, uh, build just relationships, and uh, have a commitment uh, to trans to self-transformation. 
Also uh, coupled with that are environmental justice principles. There are 17 environmental justice principles that talk about uh, the sacred mother earth, that talks about all of the um, exploitation of communities. Uh, so if one were to do academic research or create policies, they may want to utilize both of those uh, principles hand in hand. Um, and that's exactly what we did uh, with the NAACP and all of these partners listed here, uh, which are, for example, um, Sunrun, um, Vote Solar, uh, Envi Energy Environmental Studies Institute. Um, uh, we all came together to create a shared understanding under uh, around equitable solar policy principles. And we created eight different principles that one can use to employ policy uh, and to employ uh, actual practice in communities um, and beyond through the state house, uh, local municipalities, and at the federal government level. Uh, and the very first principle is the uh, environmental justice and Jemez organizing. Also, it's the second principle is about addressing uh, past and current um, impacts of climate change uh, by fostering and developing solar energy policies that move us toward resilient and just transition. Um, making sure that there's equitable, measurable improvements in solar adaptation and ensuring that there's consumer uh, protections in place. Uh, increase uh, advocacies for resiliency, such as uh, resilient grid, community and individuals. And when we think about that, we think about what happened in uh, Texas when the grid went down and lives were lost. And uh, had there been a grid system in mind around resiliency, possibly community owned solar uh, with energy battery storage, uh, there would have been place and resiliency hubs, there would have been places that people could go uh, for a safe haven. And looking at the cross-cutting issues around water, housing affordability, community development, workforce development, uh, integrating energy efficiency and transportation, uh, driving economic political benefits, and uh, striving for equitable uh, access um, of, uh, of solar. Um, and, uh, and we say that if I give an example in Indiana, we provided uh, testimony um, that said, although we did not believe that we were at that time around the 1600 early adopters of solar, that we were hoping to become the emerging market. Um, but hopefully with these principles and other um, champions, uh, we will soon move the adoption rate of solar access to people of color, people of African descent, low income, uh, more rampantly um, to uh, reduce their energy burden as well as to uh, provide uh, resiliency and uh, obviously to save uh, the planet. Uh, the NAACP has uh, resolutions that we passed since like 1976 uh, uh, when the energy crisis occurred, uh, but we have uh, uh, mandates uh, or policy that all of our units, which we have like over 2,500 across the nation, are uh, actively advocating for. And one is uh, mandatory renewable energy portfolio standards with the target of 25% by 2025. This does not include, uh, we do not consider nuclear uh, nor biomass as a, um, a, a just uh, energy source. Uh, we advocate for uh, wind, solar, and geothermal. Uh, NAACP calls for mandatory energy efficiency standards that requires a minimum of 2% annual retail revenue each year. Uh, that's uh, around the different uh, 
rebates and the uh, selling of uh, various appliances and things of that nature industri and, and industrials that use the most amount of energy uh, that they give uh, a total of 2% of their annual uh, retail revenue uh, to contribute to help others uh, to have energy to have energy efficiency access weatherization programs and things of that nature uh, we call for a mandatory net metering policy that allows for solar panel systems up to 2000 kilowatts uh, we call for mandatory legislation that gives minority and women uh, owned businesses equitable access to contracts and green jobs and to offer a fair chance uh, for those uh, returning citizens or formerly incarcerated. Uh, we call for mandatory legislation that allows communities to take advantage of solar energy, whether each individual has a solar panel or not, or basically uh, community owned solar. Uh, here's just some examples of uh, different champions across uh, the nation fighting for uh, energy justice. Um, uh, here we have pictured uh, members of the uh, Union Hill or Buckingham County area that were impacted by the Union Hill compressor station. Uh, we have a ECJ leader there named Karen Camplin of the Virginia State Conference, uh, along with uh, members uh, that were true stakeholders around this uh, compressor station. One of the members um, was uh, had a uh, land there that uh, in a rural area of Buckingham. And his great great grandfather was one of the freed slaves who settled in the area in the 1800s. Um, and growing up, he treasured the clean air and the healthy living. Uh, and he spent many of his summers uh, at this family farm. And there was some issues around eminent domain and the impacts of his uh, farmland and things of that nature. And obviously the NAACP and many, many others uh, all came together to fight against that compressor station. Uh, we have our Hawaii, uh, what's California Hawaii State Conference or through the leadership of the Honolulu Hawaii branch of uh, President Alfonso Braggs, uh, who held a Faith, Clean Energy, and the Green Fund convening. Um, we partnered with uh, the Environmental Energy Studies Institute. Uh, we connected with the uh, Hawaiian Green Bank, um, Green Infrastructure Authority. Uh, we brought in the Hawaiian Electric Company. Uh, who offered uh, community solar and electric vehicle charging station opportunities. Uh, and President Braggs uh, helped to lead that convening, identifying the different faith leaders. Uh, and seated next to him is a young, uh, wonderful leader named Kristen Brown, who traveled to Iceland with the NAACP delegation to look at how the sea levels are really rising and how the ice, how the ice is melting uh, there in Iceland. And she's a stellar environment, young person, um, environmental uh, justice leader. Uh, in just an example too, in Indiana, we do a lot of things with the uh, Utility Regulatory Commission, the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor, and uh, working on the Integrated Resource Plan. And in Indiana has five investor-owned utilities. Uh, we have presented within those integrated resource plans uh, within the IURC or the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission and uh, spoke around how as you do these carbon markets and CO2 reductions that they need to be equitable, um, that there needs to be programs like inclusive on bill financing that uh, be created and uh, and given to, uh, given to low income communities of color, which typically have like a, 
uh, like a very low interest rate. Um, there's like no requirement uh, for credit check, just maybe favorable uh, monthly payments on your utility bills, maybe one or two missed payments within a 12 month period, things of that nature. Um, and also, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that NAACP does ha have a resolution that we presented uh, opposing carbon markets, carbon trading, carbon capture, sequester, and storage. Uh, the Indiana State Conference led with that resolution, and it was passed at the national um, convention last year. Um, and also, uh, we uh, ensure equitable location of solar development. We believe that that'll drive the economic components into communities based on where solar is deployed. Um, some things we learned and some other initiatives that we did was that uh, once we started helping to train people in solar, transportation was an issue to get all the way out to the large utility scale um, facilities. Um, so those are the kind of things that one might want to consider or work on how to have equitable transportation access so that people can uh, work these new clean energy jobs. And my understanding, the trades are um, in dire need of workers. Um, we uh, deploy, we talk about solar and wind apprenticeships, uh, again, the contract opportunities. Uh, we've helped to do surveys to uh, inform bill design and to because indiana has a high number of high disconnects um, advocating for community solar advocating for uh, certain census track data uh, we were instrumental in winning um, somewhat a victory of an amendment into a bill that will uh, call for green zones or slash maybe opportunity zones, which are areas identified as uh, high populations of color, low income, or maybe now what the federal government is calling uh, disadvantaged communities or under-resourced communities. Uh, another example of some community advocacy or organizing um, in Indianapolis, uh, there was a fight uh, to shut down the uh, coal fire power plant. Uh, there was a campaign put together by the NAACP, Just Energy Reducing Pollution and Creating Jobs campaign that called for the uh, power plant to stop burning by 2016. There were others calling for it to be shut down by 2020. Uh, we indicated that we were on the front lines, most direly impacted by the polluting systems and things of that nature created a, a, a sign-on letter, got different members, the Black Nurses Association, Concerned Clergy, and various uh, aligned groups uh, to call for the shutdown. We held a town hall at a church that was eight miles from the power plant, uh, stood in the city council with a sign saying, don't shut it, don't call for the shutdown for 2020, but call for 2016 instead. Um, it uh, was a huge polluter, 77% of the city of Indianapolis industrial um, air pollution, um, according to the Energy Justice uh, Network. And there's some pictures of that town hall and the news coverage. And at that time, Indiana had Energizing Indiana, where communities could sign up uh, to receive the free light bulbs and shower heads and things of that nature. We had the, um, the health department there for to sign up for asthma information and things of that nature. And we involved young people. That was my son at the time, who's going to be graduating uh, from high school uh, this year. Uh, we put them to work passing out uh, books and things. Uh, and uh, this is in Michigan City. Uh, at the time, there's ECJ chair named Anna. 
Uh, there's Miss uh, Faye Moore. Um, and behind, you can see a cooling station there, Michigan City. That power plant doesn't plan to shut down until 2028. NAACP has called for a sooner shutdown, and then there's been a stellar activist, uh, ECJ chair now, named Latanya Troutman, that has gone um, over and above speaking to the utility company there um, and trying to organize and stopping um, the coal ash that's being transported, especially during the pandemic and its impacts on people's air quality, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of legislation battles um, we've organized on um, bills around distributed generation and held a convening with the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus to educate them on net metering. There was a narrative that said that it was unfair to people of color, Black people, to um, uh, to, for, for distributed generation that it was unfair because only privileged people would have access uh, to solar. And as I stated before, we kind of said, well, we think that clean energy is good and that uh, we hope to be that emerging market and we want the price, the value of solar to be down so that we can access it and afford it. Um, and many other different uh, legislation, in fact, uh, now, um, uh, we fought to stop a moratorium on coal fire power plant retirement. We've uh, spoken and provided testimony on a House Bill 1220 on uh, 21st Century Energy Development Task Force uh, in Indiana. We called for equitable investments in these, quote, green zone, which I actually obtained from a phenomenal uh, book. Uh, of great activists called Energy uh, Democracy Advancing Equity and Clean Energy Solutions. And that's where I learned about the green zone concept. Uh, and um, right now, uh, we've uh, right now we're trying to fight uh, House Bill 1209, 1249, which wants to do carbon capture sequester sequestration. Uh, we know that this can cause fracking. Uh, some research I read said that it does really little to reduce CO2 emissions. It does nothing by way of cleaning the, uh, you know, uh, the air quality uh, for the people that live uh, in the areas. Uh, House Bill 1221 is the electric vehicle um, a charging stations. We were successful in getting an amendment through a representative cherish prior who did an amendment that says that we want some of these charging stations in uh, diverse communities uh, these charging stations apparently provide revenue uh, so if you have a faith-based institution that has uh, parking uh, and these charging stations go there they can obtain that revenue and then that revenue then continues to serve and help uh, the community in their mission and things that they do. Uh, we uh, fought against a nuclear bill, Senate Bill 271, uh, and then Senate Bill 411, which is a siting bill. We most recently went ahead and uh, supported that bill, but we also called for uh, that the siting be placed in disadvantaged communities and that um, the access to minority business enterprise contracts and that they be uh, located in, um, I think it was the contracts and the disadvantaged communities. Uh, and then a while back, we did some organizing around the clean power plan and there was the clean energy incentive plan under the Obama administration. Uh, pictured here is uh, Dr. Carlton Waterhouse, who now I believe is with the US EPA. At the time he was with um, the uh, university, um, the, the law, University of Law in uh, Indianapolis. and. Uh, helped uh, to provide test expert testimony. Uh, we provided some organizing with um, 
different groups like Climate Justice Alliance and Kepra Institute and many people from all across the Midwest to embark. At the time, uh, the EPA administrator, Susan Hedman, was there. She literally took a call around. She joined us and then she had to leave because of the Flint crisis. And then soon after, she resigned literally that same day uh, that we were there. And uh, just to uh, lift up that, uh, you know, African Americans pay uh, 41 billion uh, to the energy sector in 2009, according to the American Association of Blacks in Energy, and yet uh, we held only 1.1 percent of the energy jobs and only gain. Uh, 0.01% of the revenues from the, the energy sector. And therefore, uh, this is both inequity in the incidence of disease and economic burden for communities of color that host these uh, energy pollution, uh, energy production facilities. Uh, here is uh, Rocky Mountain, Colorado, uh, Rocky Mountain Conference President uh, Rosemary Lytle, who did a power up clean energy jobs uh, in her community and help to, along with partners like Grid Alternatives, and help to uh, train uh, returning citizens or formerly incarcerated. She did the very first model of this. Uh, then after, we did one in Evansville, Indiana, uh, where we trained, as you can see, these persons of uh, color uh, to um, to learn how to um, deploy solar. We had a demonstration house provided by Morton Solar, who was a union um, solar business. Um, and uh, they, we partnered with IDEW, Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Uh, and uh, these persons were offered to be part of um, getting jobs through the union. Uh, but there, this is the example of the transportation concerns uh, because th there was utility scale solar that was far out. Uh, this was uh, such an impressive model or initiative that uh, the IBEW uh, covered it and uh, distributed to all 750,000 of their members across the, the globe or the, the USA. And um, also to the right here is a solar panel we placed on uh, Greater St. James Community Center, uh, which is in the Fourth Ward, which is in a low income community of color. And this um, uh, church will, our community center will save like 900 and some odd dollars a month, as well as reduced around uh, 19, equivalent to 19,000 cars of uh, CO2 uh, emissions coming um, off uh, out of the atmosphere. Uh, and then uh, the synergy continues with our Laporte count. LaPorte County, Michigan's, uh, Michigan City branch, where they then created the Building Soul Power, uh, and they partnered with Work One and Elevate Energy and, and others uh, to start to create a training program to train uh, people in what we call the Build the Black to Green Pipeline. Uh, this is uh, attorney uh, James Dillon, a young person uh, in the NAACP, and uh, this is a time that we were demonstrating in the streets right on Martin Luther King Street, uh, calling for the Indianapolis Power and Light to uh, provide a community solar. We wanted to um, have them uh, place into their integrated resource plan community solar. And we had all of these sites identified, the VFW, a barbecue uh, restaurant, a, a, a couple of churches that were all in this uh, community, this low income community of color. And uh, we were saying it'd be great to have this community on solar and it would reduce all these institutions energy burden. And then they could provide this solar to this community that's living in this old housing stock that could really benefit. We had the vision, um, but they did not uh, uh, accept it into their integrated resource plan. But we put the vision out there. And we called it the This Is Us campaign. And we've uh, spoken with the governor, uh, President Bowling, and myself. 
uh, and we've been in the 21st Century Task Force speaking to the governor about equity and, of Indiana, about equity and energy and, and all the things that I'm talking about now. Uh, we brought all of the members, uh, well, several of the member presidents from across the state uh, to talk about all the different uh, issues around education, prison reform, criminal justice, as well as the energy justice realm. Uh, the NAACP has many, many different reports. I'm just teeing up, two, I think, two here. One is called our Just Energy Policies and Practice um, Toolkit. Uh, we have the lights out in the cold report that talks about reforming utility shutoffs. We talk about uh, how, you know, energy really is a human right. Uh, we saw the things that uh, happen when someone that maybe is dependent on um, insulin or uh, someone dependent on oxygen. And uh, there was a woman in upstate uh, East, uh, upstate that uh, her house, uh, her utility was disconnected, her electric energy, uh, even though I think it was that they had just paid the bill, but it was shut off. Uh, she ended up dying because her oxygen, she wasn't able to get it to, to run without the electricity. Um, and so it is a, a human, energy is a human right. And then uh, lastly here, uh, this is AJ Patton. He uh, partnered with us to become a speaker. We uh, really wanna find some ways to, to work with him, but he is uh, a minority business enterprise. He's uh, developing housing and solar and doing energy efficiency in Chicago. Um, and uh, so he's a, a great bright light uh, of what uh, the future looks like. And uh, I'll just close by saying um, it is energy democracy. Let's just say it was uh, uh, energy democracy and that uh, local communities can uh, then begin to create just energy boards and they then opt to secure community owned solar and they opt to create these resilience hubs uh, could we imagine community-owned solar access by a public school, which are typically under-resourced and filled with black and brown and low-income scholars? A school uh, where scholars must learn in spite of how hot it is in the classroom because their school has no central air or air conditioning. Now imagine the reduction of the school's energy burden with energy efficiency infused and access to solar. Now saving money that can go toward the scholar's education, for example, computers, or toward their environmental uh, quality, for example, air conditioning. And also apparently what happened in Arkansas was that the extra funds from uh, doing clean energy measures went to teacher salary increases. Now imagine that minority business enterprise that can develop and build the solar. And the data shows that the minority business enterprises tend to hire black and brown people and thus can power up equitable clean energy jobs. Now imagine the schools serving as resilience hubs uh, that, a tra that if a tragedy occurred like in Texas where a child died could be avoided because the community would have access to a place for their resistance and resilience uh, to the impacts of the climate changing um, and can uh, eliminate the food apartheid conditions, the transit uh, deserts, and the ability uh, to thrive. Uh, thank you. I apologize if I went over, <laughs> so sorry. I'm not able to hear. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? 
Great. You're right. <laughs> so any questions in the audience here? Yeah. Well, if, if there's no questions, there's a question from the floor there. Okay. We, we need a microphone. Yeah. So we're going to be taking around some microphones so you can hear too. Hey there. Uh, my name is Maria. Um, I know you mentioned that the NAACP primarily supports solar, wind, and geothermal as um, primary energy sources. I know that one of the biggest barriers to adoption of widespread clean energy is trying to find good storage solutions. Um, but of course, battery storage also has its own uh, wealth of equity considerations as it is an extractive um, industry like oil and gas can be. I'm curious if the NAACP has some equity considerations for storage solutions, specifically battery storage or a stance on uh, finding storage solutions at all. Thank you. That's a great question. I don't, I'm pretty sure we have not uh, passed a resolution, so you might be giving me an idea around that. Uh, but we have signed on to some principles with the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists uh, around energy storage, and we were a part of a process uh, where it was brought up about the different hazards that uh, energy storage has um, and its impacts on communities. Uh, so uh, certainly uh, that is something uh, to, um, to work on and to, to look into those impacts. But we have partnered, participated, uh, but I don't think we've passed a policy or a resolution. And I'll also say that uh, we did recently change uh, our initiative from the solar equity initiative to the equitable clean energy initiative. So we hope to bring in all the different um, clean energy partners, including um, those working on battery um, storage. Is there an, I thought there was another question. Somebody else had their hand up? No? Okay, if there's no question on the floor right now, the, the, the uh, students submitted some questions in advance and there's one I'd like to, to, to ask you. Um, the question is, what is your vision of an energy system that is rebuilt in the vision of equity and justice? And would it be possible to achieve these goals in our lifetime? Not a small question. You know. Yeah, very, very small question. That was a great question. <laughs> well, I think I'd like to think my closing remarks kind of uh, touched on that, just imagining uh, communities being more safe and, and more resilient and having access to clean energy, uh, everything from um, our children riding on a electric vehicle buses as opposed to diesel buses, uh, communities having access to community owned solar and that all of these polluting systems are shut down. And I uh, am definitely a believer that it's going to occur in uh, this lifetime, uh, anytime um, that one, uh, in my uh, humble belief that Denise can be here speaking before Yale uh, University and recently some other big Ivy institutions, uh, that means that uh, you all are learning and hearing from uh, people that are in the uh, civil and human rights uh, frame and, and so uh, all of us will work on these solutions. And, uh, and I think the listening and, uh, and learning um, is, is the beginning of that. And also, I'll say that uh, I stay inspired because I've been in many, many different groups and networks where we're constantly working on the shared understanding um, and we're constantly working together. Um, in order to uh, create uh, change and, and that we all seem to have this common vision of possibility that, that we know is possible. And uh, two other things, one of my colleagues, the great Dr. Jacqueline Patterson said, you know, uh, we solved, uh, we came up with a vast scene in record time for this pandemic, right? So if we can do that, then we can come up in record time uh, to the solutions to, uh, to climate change and to uh, racial inequity. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Or should I dive into the next question? 
All right, next question. Um, can you speak to some of the most successful regulatory campaigns you've witnessed and share what you think has made them so successful? Oh, that's pretty tough. Um, the regulatory experience that I have is uh, in Indiana and um, it's very complicated. Uh, we're working to secure uh, like legal representation to represent us in that space. Uh, I guess the, the biggest victories uh, that we've had is just simply uh, being in that room. Uh, we provided data to the uh, regulatory commission. We are calling for diverse uh, commissioners to serve on the commission. And this is both from the state and our national frame. Uh, I think we have uh, a new up and coming victory, hopefully here. One of our uh, members is running for commissioner uh, in uh, regulatory commissioner in one of the states. Uh, we hope she'll be successful with just the idea that one is running or one that can be considered to be appointed uh, will, um, I think, will move or bend that arc uh, toward more equitable and uh, just regulations. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. I, I, I actually cannot think of any concrete uh, victories in the regulatory frame right now, except for that, uh, that movement so far. Can I follow up with a, a follow on question? I don't, if I don't see any other. What do you think it would take to, uh, to allow us to have some, some regulatory victories? What's, what, are, what are the biggest barriers and, and, how can, and how do you see them being overcome? Uh, to me, it's, the, uh, it's all of the complexity around the rulemaking and you really have to have someone that's committed to it uh, on a regular basis. And that's why uh, and we realized in the Indiana conference how important that is. But then as we look for an attorney, we need to find uh, legal minds and it, the one, someone that has a, a, is it a law license in Indiana and two, someone that has a commitment to energy justice. And uh, to get both of those in Indiana, I have found is uh, complicated right now. Uh, but so now we're trying to import someone in maybe. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then once we have that, because from a volunteer, I mean, we, we've had success in having our volunteers, including myself, uh, go to public hearings, provide testimony, you know, put signs up and things of that nature. But the, the real, uh, I think, change agent is being able to intervene in the various cases, um, to be able to intervene when you say that community-owned solar would be equitable here on Martin Luther King Street, uh, to have someone be able to actually follow up uh, with that legal uh, frame and knowledge to really make that happen. And then other groups uh, that are, uh, that have been maybe uh, more resourced or, um, or, or more uh, uh, knowledgeable in this, in this space uh, have been able to strike up the settlements or have the expert support, I'll say, uh, strike up settlements and then be able to provide uh, whatever their vision is around that settlement to communities. So, um, what's needed is, is, a, is lawyers, uh, community lawyers. I think there's some like in California that created a community a frame of lawyers that will come into communities. Maybe my, like uh, how doctors have done, how they have to serve a couple of years in uh, low income disadvantaged communities. It'd be great to have uh, lawyers that, have, that do that provide uh, environmental energy or specifically energy justice law clinics. Uh, I was gonna say, we should raise that at the law school, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more question is, um, what would you have rather uh, have been done uh, as against say uh, SB 309, uh, which got a net metering in Indiana, what, how would you have structured a, a different approach? 
uh, SB 309 it was the bill that wanted to uh, stop the net metering in Indiana. Is that uh, right? right? And now Indiana, and because of Senate Bill 309, um, net metering will end in Indiana, at least the value of solar will end uh, July 2022. Uh, so we'd much rather have great, greater value uh, for uh, those that want to obtain uh, rooftop solar. Uh, it will impact our work because uh, we're, we're going to uh, launch uh, one more uh, solar project. Maybe we could squeeze in a second one, but uh, it'll be deployed uh, March 2022. And, you know, not only because of all the great benefits that clean energy has uh, solar, uh, uh, but because we know that it's about to expire July 2022. And we had the model that we did in uh, Evansville. We did the model, uh, well, we tried to do a model in Hammond. We ended up doing energy efficiency there. Uh, where we put in uh, light bulbs and they're saving a lot on a health center. And now we're about to do the one in Kokomo. And unfortunately, uh, the value that comes from net metering uh, is going to, to impact um, those non-for-profit institutions. And we have great leaders that I think, uh, I think we just passed at the, they just passed at the federal level where non-for-profits can now um, file uh, net metering off on their taxes or get the tax credit, which is something that uh, had not happened before. And so now Indiana, if we have uh, a low value to uh, distribute uh, generation across the grid and people aren't really getting a value. I think it's like two cents versus 11 cents. Uh, people will not be inspired uh, to purchase uh, clean energy. So um, I think it's going to have devastating uh, effects. I'm even trying to see if I can go ahead and uh, deploy it on my, onto my own personal home, both from a, um, practicality and also for as a model of discussion, um, you know, to say, you know, that, that it, how important it is. So, sorry, I don't, I don't know if I answered that very well for you, but. Great, no, thank you so much. We are at time for the formal hour. Um, we really want to thank you uh, and we're grateful for you sharing your insights with us and all your thoughts. Um, a lot of fodder for discussion. Um, but I hope everyone will join me in giving a, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take great care. It.